All right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we're particularly excited as we are diving in this September, so thanks to our classes for joining us lately for the first time this year as we start our 2019-2020 season. Uh, we've got seven classes joining us from across North America right now, so I want to give them a chance to say a little bit of a, a hi. We've got Miss Gogney's grade fives in Algonquin, Illinois. Hi, guys. <laughs> We've got Miss Lackey's grade fours in Freehold in New Jersey. <laughs> We've got Mr. Southward's grade one twos in Cochrane in Ontario. Hi, guys. <laughs> We've got Mr. Richards, grade, uh, sorry, Mr. Richards, grade six, sevens in Amherst View, Ontario. Hi. We got so many. We've got Miss, uh, you know, I'm missing them because they're all cycling over. We got Miss Holden's grade threes in uh, Spruce Grove in Alberta. Hi, guys. All right. And we've got Miss, uh, yeah, Miss. Mr. Harris, Miss Harrison's grade one, twos in Ear Falls, Ontario. Hi, guys. I think I didn't miss anyone. I apologize if I did. Uh, of, of course, the reason you guys are all joining us for our speakers, so we are joined live uh, by Martha and Matt at the Na North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. So they welcome over a million visitors a year, which makes them the biggest attraction in the entire state. We're going to find out a little bit why today as we dive in with their butterflies and moths, the most beautiful insects in the world. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Martha. Thanks so much for joining us and take it away. Sure. I'm happy to be here with all of you talking about one of my favorite group of insects, one of my favorite groups. And we are actually going to focus a little bit on some of our special guests today. And they are live caterpillars, so I will feature them in just a moment. But here at the Museum of Natural Sciences, we have an annual celebration called Bug Fest every year, and it is taking place this Saturday. And so this is part of the reason why I have our special guests with us. But we are going to focus on the order Lepidoptera. So that is the group of insects that butterflies and moths belong to. And I was thinking, what are my favorite things? about this group of insects. And one would be their caterpillars, because maybe they're not as beautiful as the adults flying around, but they're pretty fascinating. Two, I love butterflies and moths because they're everywhere. So you and I can see them wherever we may be. And sometimes we can even see the same kinds, even though we can be really far apart. So that's the second reason why I really love butterflies and moths. And third, it's a really fascinating way for us to make observations about nature in our own backyards because we can put these plants that they rely on to survive everywhere where we live. We can put them at school, we can have them at parks, we can have them at our house. So it's a really fun way to get up and close and personal with nature. So that's my job here at the museum. I'm an educator and I'm a naturalist. So I like to make lots of observations about the things that we encounter in the outdoors. So let's look at what that word Lepidoptera looks like. So order Lepidoptera. There's 160,000 species just of moths and there are about 17,500 species of butterflies. So there are many, many more moths than butterflies. And then here in North Carolina, we can find about 177 different kinds of butterflies and then about 12,000 species of moths and butterflies across the United States. So we have a pretty good diversity here in North America. And then if you think about that word Lepidoptera, what does it mean? You may have heard it before. It might be a new word to you. If you are hearing this word for the first time, it won't be the last time. But I'm going to show you a picture of what that word actually means. And here's a close up of a butterfly's wings. They look like tiny little scales, like little roof shingles. And so Lepidoptera, translates to scaly wing. So butterflies and moths are the scaly winged insects. Other things that are super cool about butterflies and moths are their mouth parts, right? So if we are classifying insects by all of their different features, one of the things that we use are mouth parts. That can really tell us a lot about the different kinds of insects. So I have my little noisemaker here and it's a great demonstration of a butterfly mouth part. So if I was flying up to a flower, that is the mouth part that I would use to get nectar from inside of the flower. 
and it has a special name. And I'll give you all a minute to think about what that name might be of a butterfly's mouth part. Here's a close up picture. So under really, really high magnification. Here is a not so close up picture. And then this is what the word is. Proboscis. So butterflies and moths have a proboscis, and this is what they are, they're adapted to sip nectar from deep inside the flower. And in the meantime, while they are doing that and getting food for themselves, they are also gathering pollen on their bodies, and they are moving the pollen between plants. So they are an important group of pollinating insects as well. So here is the butterfly and moth general body parts. Just like all insects, they have a head and a thorax and an abdomen. They've got six legs, they've got antenna, and they have those scaly wings. And then if you were looking at butterfly and moth antenna, they can be really, really diverse in their shape and in their, in their length. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of that in a moment. But I also want to talk about the larval stage of a butterfly, because that's pretty unique for insects as well. Here is a close up of a larval Moth. This is a caterpillar face. I think it's kind of cute. Maybe you think it looks a little bit like an alien. <laughs> but if you are looking at this face, you might notice antenna. Can any of you see where the antenna are on this? It's kind of hard to tell. It looks pretty different than an adult butterfly. And then I'm playing a sound for you. Can everybody hear that? Can. Yeah, so it's a pretty awesome sound. This is the sound of caterpillars eating. There are some caterpillars that are so large that if you keep them inside on their host plant and you're really quiet, you can actually hear them munching on the leaves. So they are munching with their really strong mouth parts, which are circled here. The first circle showing you the eyes of the caterpillar, and then we're circling the mouth, and then here are the antenna. So when you are looking at an insect in the body parts, you can often see those features of the adult in the larval stage too, which is pretty cool. So that is a close up personal look at a caterpillar. Just a little face. And how does a caterpillar see or taste? That's kind of a really interesting question. I'll mention that in a moment. Maybe not how, but like what they're doing when they're growing and eating. How does a butterfly or a moth see a flower? compared to you and I, because that's pretty cool too. How do they even know where the nectar is? If you were to look at a flower, here's a picture of our flower. The flower on the left is a dandelion. So is the flower on the right. But insects are able to see different wavelengths of light. And so the flower on the right looks is what an insect is seeing. And so the red is highlighting the areas of the pollen within the flower. So it's kind of like a little landing zone for insects. So different flowers have different kinds of light that are seen by insects differently than you and I. So how do you tell a butterfly or a moth apart? That's another really interesting question. How do we tell them apart? So we're looking at body shape. We can look at abdomen shape. We can look at antenna. We can look at how, it's kind of a funny way to describe an insect, but how furry is an insect? How furry or fuzzy does it look? So here is a quick picture to show you one type. This one might be one you've seen before. This is one that's found all across North America. This is actually North Carolina state butterfly. This is the tiger swallowtail. So this is definitely a butterfly. How about this one? It looks a little fuzzier. You might often see it at dusk or at nighttime. It's called a sphinx moth. This is actually one of my favorite types of moths. And I have a, a larvae to show you today. How about this one? You might have seen this one before. This is also a pretty, yeah, I see some hands being raised there in the background. Here's a luna moth. And their caterpillars are super cool too. They're really big and lime green. And then here's another caterpillar, or another another insect that kind of connects all of us, that you might all recognize this one. This is a monarch butterfly. 
And so they are migrating back and forth between Mexico and different areas in North America. So you and I can all see these either on host plants in their yard or just kind of passing through when they're making their journey north or their journey south. So butterflies are moths. If you were looking at these pictures, notice the dainty little body of the butterfly. Their antenna are pretty straight with a little club at the end. If I show you this moth picture, the moth is much furrier. That I was telling you, it's kind of funny to describe a moth as a hairy insect, but it's got a fuzzier body. And you can look at its antenna that look like little feathers. And we describe those antenna as plumose. And so a lot of moths have these plumose antenna. And this is how they are picking up on the scents of each other. So they communicate with pheromones. So moths have really different shaped antenna than butterflies. So those are some of the clues that help you figure out who is who and what is what. You can look at what food they're eating as a larvae. That kind of helps you figure out what they are as well. All right, so other favorite things about butterflies and moths. I told you a few in the beginning. Another favorite thing is how they grow because the life cycle of insects is fascinating. So they all do it a little bit differently, but they still share many of their stages in common. So here is a picture, complete metamorphosis. That is what butterflies and moths go through. Some insects only hatch out of an egg as a miniature, and every time they molt, they look more and more like the adult version of themselves. Butterflies and moths have a complete change from larvae to adult. And there's huge variation. Remember how many thousands of species there are? You can tell them apart by looking at their eggs, you can tell them apart by the chrysalis or the pupa. You can tell them apart, of course, by the larval form and the adult form. So here is a specimen of eggs that we had at the museum. And I actually got to raise these babies at my house. So the sound of the caterpillars eating, those were caterpillars that hatched out of these eggs. And I, of course, recorded them when they were larger. So looking up close at these eggs, they all came out, and so these eggs are three months old already, but there's kind of these little clear openings from where the little caterpillars hatched out, and they were really tiny. And so part of being a naturalist and you and I practicing our observation skills is just looking for changes. And so if you look in this next picture here, you can see these are two different kinds of eggs. The one on the right was a moth larvae, and look how the eggs look different next to each other. The clear one is a larvae that just came out, and then you can see the yellowish eggs. That they, nothing may happen with them, or they needed a little bit longer, and then you can see some that have the little dark black and orange color, and those are almost getting ready to come out of their egg. If you are looking closely at your larvae and your eggs, you can kind of see when they change and when they're getting ready to move on to the next phase. And it might look a little bit like this. Of course, in high speed. There's a lot of wiggling going on in the caterpillar phase. Wiggling to get out of your egg, wiggling to get out of your exoskeleton as you're growing into your different instars. And I have another picture to show you that next. Let me show you this. This one is going to be a black swallowtail larvae. So talking about all that wiggling. Caterpillars are eating machines and therefore they are growing machines. They pretty much eat 24 hours a day. And if you were trying to look for a caterpillar, some of the best times to go caterpillar hunting are at nighttime when they can come out of their hiding places and be eating without having to worry about birds coming along and finding them to snack on them. So I, since I just showed you the video of a black swallowtail caterpillar molting, I wanted to zoom over onto our live caterpillar so that we could take a look at it. This one came from my yard as well. Black swallowtail butterflies, their larvae love to eat parsley and carrot and dill and fennel. And that's what I had fennel in my yard. And you might notice something about my caterpillar. 
What is it not doing? It's not moving, it's not eating. And so that's something really fun when you are watching a caterpillar in action. I think that this caterpillar is either getting ready to molt into its next size, or it might be getting ready to molt into its chrysalis. And so I'm gonna demonstrate really quick the position of the caterpillar, because it's kind of fun to pretend to be an insect. So I'm leaning back like this. If I was a caterpillar, now you gotta picture me as a caterpillar, this part that's my arms would be the silk that I spun around my body to help me do the lean. And then when I molt, my chrysalis is in this position too. Kind of funny. So back to my caterpillar, he's kind of doing the lean. You might all notice him doing the lean. So we'll see, I'll, let, I'll have to report back and tell you if this one molts into its chrysalis or if it's gonna molt into the next size. And then some other really cool caterpillars to show you. I'm gonna kind of move him out of the way. I have four. There's this one right here. And he's eating a different kind of food. He's eating the, the leaves of a hickory tree. You see the little horn on the back of its, of its body right here? All of the caterpillars and most of them that have that little horn, they're called, they're sphinx moth caterpillars. So you might hear them called horn worms. And if you ever tried to grow tomatoes or peppers and you had a big caterpillar come and eat it all, it's usually this group of, butter, of moths. They have this little horn on their back. And it's not doing it right now, but this caterpillar can actually hiss. It will wave its body around and hiss at you by squeezing air out of its little breathing holes, which is pretty cool. All right, let's take a look at a few more. Let's see, get a zoom out and find them. Here's this fun yellow one, yellow and fuzzy. And of course its name is not yellow and fuzzy. I'll tell you its name in a moment. And then this one is called a dagger moth. Look at this amazing diversity in just four species of butterflies and moths. So sometimes they're really fuzzy. This yellow one too, going back to this yellow one, it's called a spotted apoloides. And I don't know how much closer we can zoom in, but it's got these little black tufts right there. Yeah. It's so fuzzy and cute. It looks like maybe you want to touch it and cuddle it and snuggle it, right? Like a little teddy bear. But if you are talking about the larvae of moths, often the really fuzzy furry moths can be the ones that sting the worst. So typically you and I would not want to pick them up with our hands, but we would be using a stick or the leaves that they're on to kind of move them around and look at them closer. So better to just look with your eyes and not touch with your hands, but very fascinating. So I think, do we have like three minutes left? Yeah, certainly, however long you need. Okay, all right, so I wanted to show you the other video. So how does it happen exactly that a butterfly changes from a caterpillar into its chrysalis or its pupa. And if you are lucky enough, you will get to see it live in person on your own. But today we're gonna to be lucky enough because some of our friends at the museum film these things in action. So here is a monarch butterfly molting into its last phase. You can see it's pulling out of its old skin as the caterpillar phase and underneath is the chrysalis. And so where the head was is where the head will be of the butterfly when it comes out. There's all that wiggling I was telling you about. And then they'll be still for a while and the outside of the chrysalis will change to be more of a green color. And this will be about a week. And then a week later, remember I was telling you how the egg changes color or the, or the chrysalis changes color? As the butterfly is getting ready to develop, the chrysalis turns dark like the wings of the butterfly. And this is a monarch butterfly. And now the chrysalis is clear as the butterfly emerges. And this takes just a couple of hours for them to come out and hang upside down for their wings to finish expanding and to have the blood filling their wings and to have their bodies hardened so that they can fly around. So that's one example for a butterfly. This would be probably how most butterflies are changing into their butterfly form during metamorphosis. Now, my other favorite group of moths are the silk moths. 
And this is that Cecropia caterpillar, the close up of the face I showed you and the sound of the caterpillars chewing. That was a Cecropia moth or a silk moth. They spin a cocoon around their bodies. And so caterpillars, some of them have silk glands. And so they are pulling silk from their, that their own bodies make and they're making the cocoon with this silk. And it gets to be where you can no longer see what's going on inside of the cocoon anymore. It's like a little magic show. So there's the caterpillar making its cocoon, making its cocoon. This takes probably two days. And then this is what the cocoon looks like when it hardens. But if you want to see what was going on inside of the cocoon, you can carefully cut open that silk because it's just like a little uh, sleeping bag. Here, we can zoom in on it and I'll show you. And there, the chrysalis would not be harmed by looking at the inside to see what's going on. And here's a video of what's going on inside. There's one last molt that has to take place. It's gonna shed its old larvae skin. Remember, lots of wiggling. It's a lot of work to get out of your old skin, your old exoskeleton. And then that little form often turns to be this brown form. So here is a, an example of a pupa. So now instead of being a chrysalis, a lot of moths are pupating. And so they either pupate in this silken, in this silken chamber like this, or they pupate, we say they pupate naked in the soil. So they don't make a little cocoon, they just bury, they go down in the soil in a little hole and they change into this pupa form. And a lot of these will overwinter. So the ones that, that big Cecropia moth I keep talking about, this one, the cocoons that I have at my house now, I will have until next April. So they will wait until next year to come out because it took them three months to get big enough to turn into their pupa. So a lot of energy being stored. All right, one more video real quick, and then we can take some questions. So at the end, this is what's happening when the moth is ready to emerge. They pull out of their pupa form with their legs. And then they have to crawl up something so that their wings can dangle upside down and let gravity do the work of letting the wings expand. And of course, the video is, is sped up, but you get the idea. Really fascinating. And a lot of these big moths do not eat as adults. It's just the larvae that's doing all the eating. The moths do not eat. So that's caterpillars and moths in a quick, quick story. Again, they're really fascinating. We find them everywhere. You and I can find the same ones in the different places that we live. They sort of unite all of us, right? Because they travel back and forth and they need our help. We can give them food pretty easily by planting flowers and, and larvae food. So I'd love to take some questions if you guys are ready. Very cool. Well, thank you so, so much for that. Uh, that was amazing. Some of the best footage of, of butterflies and moths I've ever seen personally. Uh, so that was <laughs> great. I also, so we're, uh, before we dive into questions live, I want to note that the few groups watching on YouTube live. So if you guys want to type in your questions in the chat bar, I will pass them on to Martha. So please do do that. Uh, but we're going to start with a class that I forgot to intro. Um, so Ms. Mossman crosses class grade twos in Sterling, Ontario. If you guys want to kick us off, come on up. Matt, can you raise the volume? Good, so you should be demuted, guys. It wants to demute you. There we go. Oh, no, you're stuck on mute. Can you hear us? You're good. You're good. Okay, hear it? Hi. Oh, my Hi. Oh, 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 just a second. <laughs> Listen. Why do monarchs have gold on their pupa? Oh, why do they have gold on their pupa? You know, I don't have an answer for you because I haven't really... I don't know that we know the answer to that. Cool. Maybe it helps with the camouflage some. I'm not sure. And that's a great, actually, I'm so glad you answered that way, but it's so nice to highlight the kids that, you know, not every question in science is answered. And that's why it's so important to get out there and do these sort of observations yourself and become scientists and learn these sort of things. But great, great question, guys. All right, let's go to Ms. Gogney's class. If you guys have a question, come on up. Okay, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. we are we got two. Two, let's do it. Okay. How many different species of butterflies are there? So I will answer just for North America, it's about 12,000 species of butterflies. Cool. That's a lot. And what's your second? 
question. The other one is, uh, why do moths eat clothes? Oh, yeah. oh, why do moths eat clothes? This is not a joke, right? This is a question. It sounds like a knock-knock joke. <laughs> so the larvae of the moths are what are eating your clothes. And so the larvae are eating um, the, the fabrics, right? Because they, they come from plants. And so some of those larvae are adapted and specialized for eating, essentially eating your clothes as part of their growing. Okay. That's usually not our intention, right? We, we like to have moths and, and butterflies around, but maybe not inside our houses eating our clothes and putting holes in things, right? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not for the best. Yeah. All right, uh, Mr. Sedford's class, if you guys have a question, come on up. Yeah, uh, Theo has a question. What does the antenna do? What do the antenna do? Some really cool things. So antenna on insects can pick up air vibrations. So from the air moving around them, and sometimes they can also pick up smells in the air. So it's kind of a feeling and tasting. Cool. All right, uh, let's go to Mr. Richard's class, if you guys have one. You Campbell. Be oh. Campbell. Yep. <coughs> yep, sorry, he's coming. <laughs> What is the wing beat of both butterflies and moths? Ooh. Hey, like, wing beats? Yeah, like how fast do they beat their wings? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. I do not have a uh, per second wing beat. That's a good question for me to look at. <laughs> I would say, I'm trying to think. I think the wing <laughs> so moths fly around, like as far as if you were making observations, they're moving their wings fairly quickly compared to some of the other ones. Yeah. But um, I don't know. If, I don't have that answer. That's a good one. Thanks <laughs> for stumping me. I'd like to be stumped. <laughs> we were trying. We, we were two for four so far. Um, That's right. <laughs> it's really neat, actually, to highlight the fact that different insects beat their wings at completely different rates. So, like, a uh, mosquito is really loud. We get that buzzing sound in our ear. So, you can actually, there's actually a device that can shoot, like, a little laser at insects and measure the wing speed of it. This actually exists, I promise. I'll try and pass on information of that at the end. That's cool. <laughs> I did um, not know about that tool. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll buy one for the museum. All right, uh, Ms. Holden's class, if you guys have a question, go for it. Yeah, you're good. How do they know what to camouflage on? Ah. So there's different types of camouflage. So there's the camouflage where your colors help you blend into your surroundings. So if you're a green moth, you're going to be hanging out around green plants. And then there's camouflage where you look, it's not really helping you to hide, but it's uh, camouflage is for defense, right? So some of them have colors that make them look like a snake or make them look like an owl's eyes when the wings open up. And this is how they've adapted for the millions of years that they've been on earth. Cool. So it's very, it varies really greatly depending on whether it lives in a rainforest or in the desert or whether it lives in our backyards. So. There's for shading and, and, and hiding in for dark and light. There's for bright, meaning don't eat me like a monarch. So lots of different ways and colors that can help them defend themselves. So camouflage is just part of that story. And I think it's really good to highlight the fact that uh, there's a good natural selection story that if the moth or butterfly does not land on something that it camouflages against, something will eat it. And then it won't have any babies that will land on those things anymore. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, Miss Harrison's class, you just want to come up. Why are moths attracted to light? Why? Moths and other insects. So insects can navigate by the light from the moon. And so they can kind of direct their, and the sun, they direct their bodies to the direction and the angle that they need to be going. And because our porch lights or other really bright lights are even closer than the moon might be, then the insects end up kind of getting sidetracked and they get distracted and they end up trying to figure out where they're going based on that bright light instead of maybe the moon. So it's that they're a little bit confused. And actually that's something you and I can do that's really helpful is to keep our lights to a minimum at nighttime. So then we're not distracting the other animals that are moving around at nighttime. Cool, all right. Uh, and then Ms. Lackey's class to wrap up our first round of questions. Come on up guys. Go ahead. Since butterflies have such short lives, how do they migrate so far? Oh, so some of them have short lives, right? 
Some of them only live maybe a week. But monarch butterflies, for example, right, that's one of our greatest examples of long distance migration. They actually live eight to nine months because they fly down in the fall. And then those adults, the next spring, are the ones that make that first step coming home and they lay their eggs and they begin the life cycle of moving north again. So some of them can live longer and that has a lot to do with what they're able to eat and store up as fat inside of their bodies. Or then if they live in a really cold place, a lot of them become very still and inactive and almost kind of hibernate through the winter. Because there are some butterflies that can survive through a winter as well as adults or cool. moths. All right, uh, we've got our, our probably the teacher that joined us most on YouTube. So Ms. Hearn Smith uh, in Northeast, Northeast Hope uh, wanted to ask a couple questions, which are, so how many eggs can butterflies have at a time? So this one example of eggs of the moth, they, the moth can like, oh, here, we'll zoom in on here. They can lay hundreds of eggs in a big clump like this, this really large moth. And then a monarch butter, butterfly, I don't have like a final number, but just from observations in my yard, you might get maybe five to 10 eggs, depending on how many plants that you have. So that's a pretty wide range, five to 10 at a time versus 100 at a time. Excellent. And everything kind of in between. And then the second, they actually asked about six questions, but I'm gonna pass along just a second one for now, which sure. I think uh, it might take some from some of the live classes, which is, can you touch a butterfly's wings without damaging them? And like, what's the deal with that? A lot of people know that you touch it and it removes scales. So tell us a little more. Right, so let me see if, I don't know if I have a good picture of, I'm gonna look and see if I have a picture of somebody holding a monarch butterfly. Here, here's a good way. So if, as scientists, if we are trying to capture a butterfly to put a sticker on it, for example, like with this monarch, you hold them, there's a certain way that you can hold a butterfly or moth safely, where it's a strong part of their body and where you're not really brushing off very many scales underneath so that you're protecting their ability to fly. So we've developed tools and techniques for, for handling them safely. But you and I, just as observers, it's usually better for us to just observe with our eyes, right? Because you can brush the scales off. It's a good question too. Very cool. All right, we'll go back to Ms. Mossman's cross class. Um, come on up, guys. And you're good to go. You should, yeah, you're demuted. How are you? Okay, go ahead. How long does the moth stay in the cocoon? So the moth that I have at my house right now, they made their cocoon in the middle of in the middle of August, and they will be in their cocoon until next. April probably. Cool. So until the spring comes. All right, let's go to Ms. Gogney's class. Um, so we have three questions. Okay. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> First question is how long do they live until? Or how long do they live? So the monarch butterflies, for example, I gotta pick one example. Monarch butterflies that are, are making their way south this time of year to make the journey towards Mexico. That's where a lot of them are gonna spend the winter. There's maybe four generations. So four life cycles that have to happen. So those adults that are making their way down maybe will live oh, two weeks at the most. And then the ones that make it to Mexico, that last generation, they will last almost eight, nine months until the following, until next year. And then some of them might only live less, they might live less than a week. Yeah. So there's a lot of variability. Quick follow up on that before we go to the second question. Uh, sure. I just want to note, and I'll pass this along to classes too, but I'll send you a picture of uh, Mexico's butterfly forest because it's the most incredible, uh, you know, grouping of butterflies in the entire world. If you see one thing in nature in your life, you should probably go see that. Um, but yes, let's go back to the second question. Go ahead. Um, another one is, are, are there any butterflies that are like poisonous? Oh, yeah. So let's take, so the monarch is one of the really well-known examples. And so here um, we can look at their larvae. So here's an example of the larvae. The black and the white and the yellow colors, these are warning colors that they are distasteful. And often for you and I, I mean, well, not for us, for the birds and other animals that might try to eat it, it's just this yucky. It tastes bad. But this is a stinging caterpillar. This is called a saddleback caterpillar. And just brushing up against it, it's, almost, it's venomous. It's got venom glands under its spine. Just brushing up against it is enough to make you and I be in a lot of pain. 
So sometimes they can be toxic by being eaten, and sometimes they have these spikes and spines that make them dangerous to just be touched as defense. All right, excellent. And we'll do one more, but guys, just for future for other class, we want to stick to one question per class. We will come back to you guys, but go right ahead with the third one for now, okay? Um, the final question is, where do they like to build their cocoons? Oh, so many different places, but I can answer. Let's give you three examples. So the black swallowtail that I showed you, it will, we call them wanderers. So when the caterpillars are getting ready to pupate, then you start seeing them wandering over the sidewalk, they're crawling up the building, they just kind of appear in all these random places. So sometimes they build their chrysalis. If we go over to my black swallowtail really quick, Sometimes it will build its chrysalis right here on the end of the plant. So it'll find this really sturdy branch. Sometimes they will attach, like if it's the moth, the moth will spin its cocoon attached to leaves and sticks as well. And then there are the moths that like to dig down in the dirt. And they pupate in the ground. So if you were trying to rear a moth that did that, you would have to keep dirt in the container so that it had a place to go and hide itself. Sorry, all right, let's go to Mr. Southward's class. There we go. All right, go ahead, go up to the front. No. One second, he's coming. Okay. That's Connor. How exactly do the moths and butterflies make their silk? Oh, so they have the, the caterpillar has a silk gland just underneath their mouth. And let me see if I can show you in my caterpillar face. Here's my caterpillar face. It was at the very beginning. Here it is. It's just underneath those little, the little mouth parts. So here, if we are looking, so just underneath the mouth would be where the little silk gland is coming out of. And they pull out these strands of silk and then they move it around with their head and they can kind of maneuver it with their legs too. So they'll do this really interesting stretching motions. You'll see the caterpillar like dangling backwards like this, just all moving its silk all around its body. Cool. But it's a gland, just like spiders have a silk gland. All right, uh, Mr. Richard's class. Come on up, guys. Which species of butterfly gets the most heat off the sun radiation? Whoa. So, <laughs> I like, I, so is the idea that like, what, what butterfly can like warm up the fastest or like is best efficient at, at taking in the sun? Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't have a good answer for you, except that it's probably going to be the butterflies with the largest wingspan, right? Because they have the most surface area to capture the sun. And can you tell us the world's largest butterfly species? Oh, um, no. I can tell you the world's largest moth species. I have a really great picture. Maybe that might be looking it up. Yeah. yeah. Queen Alexandra's birdwing is our biggest butterfly. There we go. Yeah. And it is from Papua New Guinea. Cool. Yeah. About 11 inch wingspan. So if you have a dinner plate in front of you, that's how big their wings are. So I guess he'd be the best at taking in the sun. <laughs> Very cool. All right, uh, I love these questions that are like out of the blue. Fantastic, guys. Uh, let's go to Ms. Holden's class. Come on up. Yep, you're good to go. How do you think Yeah, just repeat that a little slower, sorry. How do butterflies Butterflies' wings move when their hands are on something else. Oh, so like when their legs are hanging on? Right. Oh, yeah. So insects have muscles, too. And so a butterfly has muscles that it can use to control its legs, but it also has muscles in its thorax where its wings are attached that allow it to be flexing its wings as well. Perfect. Yeah, so they have blood that moves through their bodies and they have muscles. Like you and I, but very different at the same time. Uh, awesome. Let's go to Ms. Harrison's class. We got two more questions, guys. Come on up. Um, at the start of the video, um, why does the butterfly hiss? Hiss. The first butterfly oh, why does it hiss? Oh, yeah. 
I know. I think that that butter, that larvae is getting ready to molt, which is why it wasn't moving around. It's for defense. And so my friend was telling me that when she discovered this larvae, this caterpillar, that's how she found it. She was looking around on the leaves and she heard this hissing and she heard, saw this thing moving around and it was the caterpillar hissing. And caterpillars and other insects, they have something called spiracles, which is how they get air into their bodies. And so here's a little drawing of a caterpillar. The little holes towards the legs, those are the spiracles where insects are getting air in their bodies. And so the hissing is them squeezing air out of those little holes. And it's for defense. It's to scare away things. Yeah, very cool. If a caterpillar hissed at me, I'd run away. Yeah. Um, all right, let's end up with one last question from Ms. Lackey's class. And can I say to you guys have the coolest mural behind you in your class. It's super awesome on the wall. But yeah. Thank you. <laughs> do we, um, do moths or do just butterflies pollinate? What was the last word? Or do just butterflies pollinate? Oh, oh, pollinate. Okay. okay, they both do. So there are some moths that are nectaring on plants that might be, um, flowers that might be open more at nighttime. But there are moths that come to, um, they also flying around and eating during the day as well, some of them. And so they are pollinators as well. So moths and butterflies are pollinators. All right. This has been great, guys. So many fantastic questions from all the classes. Yeah. I just want to ask one last thing of Martha. So before we wrap up, is there anywhere that you'd recommend that kids can learn more about butterflies and moths, anything that they should do to get out in nature? And last message sort of thing. Sure. So um, it's sitting on the floor. I'm going to run over and grab it really quick. <laughs> one of our favorite tools as a naturalist are field guides. So this is how you and I figure out what we are finding. And so this one is a field guide just for caterpillars. There are field guides for butterflies. There are Peterson's field guides are great resources. And then online there, or you can have it on your phone or your tablet. There's a program called iNaturalist and you can take pictures of what you see and share that all around the world and for your region as well. And sometimes people can help you identify what you are finding. And also bug guide online is another really great online resource that you can um, send in pictures and there's this whole community of people who are super into entomology and they will look into figuring out what your insect is. Outstanding. So, some of my favorites. So get out there and get your field guide guys and we'll yes. pass along resources for that too. It's gonna be a long email when we're done. Um, well, Martha and Matt, what we do at the end of every hangout, I'm gonna demute everyone's microphone. So Ms. Gogney's class, Ms. Blackie's class, South for Harris and Richards, Miles and Cross, Holden, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you guys want to join me in saying a go right ahead. Thank you guys so much. So thank you guys so much for joining us as part of our, our new year of Exploring by the Sea Your Pants. Martha and Matt, thank you so much for joining us. It's always spectacular having you guys in the museum. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone, guys, and bye for now. Bye.